were beaten by the bell this morning. And so I would just like to make a few comments to sum up this morning from the first paragraph we read tonight at verse 13. You will remember that this morning we thought fundamentally of the fact that the life of faith is a life of believing what God says simply because he says it and living on that basis. We saw in those, that last paragraph from verse 13 that the sort of faith that is exemplified in these Old Testament believers was not a trial thing but was a for life thing. They didn't take the Lord on a trial run to see if it would work out all right. They took him for better or, if you may put it that way, for worse. They took him for life, whatever might happen to them. Not only that, but the sort of faith that they had was not a faith that knew all the answers, but knew the one who knew all the answers. It was a faith that recognised that heaven is the solid reality and that's where we belong. So we sit loose on our belongingness here on earth and are certainly not prepared to belong here at all costs amongst unbelieving people where we're like foreigners. That was the faith of these people and they longed for heaven not in a no earthly use sense. They were set free to be wonderfully useful on earth precisely because they were sure and secure in their ultimate destination. And we noticed and closed with that, to me, most beautiful of thoughts, that people like this who commit themselves to the Lord, not reckoning that they're pretty good, but that God is wonderful, are the sort of people where God says, I'm not ashamed to be called their God that God should take our names. I was thinking about it as I was driving here and wondering whether somebody might meet my wife one day and say to her, oh yes, you're the woman with those awful boys in Sunday school. Or oh yes, you're the person that works in the firm with that person. You say, well I don't really want to be labelled with them, thank you very much. And yet we find this utterly amazing thing here that the Lord is prepared to be labelled with the name of a twister like Jacob and is prepared to commit himself to those not who earn their way and reach sort of grade one super class Christian but those who trust the Lord. I'm not ashamed to be called the God of Jacob. I'm not ashamed to be called your God. And how do you know? Well, I have sunk my eternal capital in keeping you forever. I have prepared for you a city. Isn't that beautiful? I think it is. Now let's go on from that point to think then about what it's going to mean to live this life of faith with a God who is that committed And people will very often say, well, the life of faith is all very well, but what about the children? You've got to be realistic about this. When I came home from the Philippines in 1977, someone said to me, well, when you didn't have children, it was all right for you to live like this, but now you've got to be sensible and responsible. What about the kids? Well, it's about the kids that we find verses 17 to 24 are talking about. And the first one we see is Abraham, the test of a man's faith. Look at verse 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise was ready to offer up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your descendants be named. He considered that God was able to raise men even from the dead. Heads figuratively, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. What a fearful thing God asked of Abraham. 
Here he was, as we thought in our children's address this morning, longing for donkey's years to have a wee boy, and when he got a wee boy and he was a hundred years old, then God says, right, give him back. God is entitled to ask you to do something tough, you know. That is his right. We are not the ones who state our terms to God. God, you may take me that far, but you are not entitled to touch this and you are not entitled to touch that and don't you ask for Isaac. It is our God's right to lay down the terms, not ours. And he does. Of course, you find this story amplified frighteningly in Genesis chapter 22 where at verse 2 the Lord says this to his friend Abraham he said take your son your only son Isaac look how he rubs it in your son your only son Isaac whom you love rubbing it in a bit more and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains of which I shall tell you Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him. And when you get to verse 12, where the Lord provides a lamb substitute, how often it turns up in scripture until Jesus came. The Lord provided a ram substitute. The Lord says, For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son your only son from me and we find in this passage that the real test of a man's commitment to God is not what he will do when it doesn't affect anybody but what he will do when it affects his children Now I would want to submit to you that many of us in our natural 20th century man and womanhood would look at this passage and say how wicked of Abraham. Did he not consider the psychological damage that he was going to do to Isaac? But God looked on Abraham and said now I know that you fear God. Now I know that your commitment is not temporal now I know that your commitment has not got strings attached. Now I know that you fear God. God still does ask hard things like that. I remember the Reverend Willie Black as he sent his children away to Chifu's school at Nanai in Japan saying, pray for the children as we commit them to God's best because God had called them. Earlier this year I sat with two couples at our Brora missionary conference and at least three of us were crying by the time we'd finished because those two couples believed that they were called to missionary work in a situation that was going to have very profound consequences for their family life and it wouldn't be just them who were called to suffer, it will be their children as well who will be called to suffer, as Isaac did. Now we are not all called to that sort of sacrifice as families. But may I put in a plea to you, when people of God are called to that, Will you stand with God and Abraham and Isaac and not with all the psychologically orientated critics who say that God is cruel and you got it wrong? I was talking to Audrey Patterson, a Glasgow girl who's found it very hard to be separated from her children for the sake of taking the gospel. A career. It's been hard enough to come to terms with what God has asked her to do. It's been even harder 
when the people of God criticize as well. And if you've got problems with the hurts of this sort of separation, it's not too bad a thing to talk to someone like Heather up there who's been through it, or Susie. It's sacrifice. But our children can prove the Lord as well as the grown-ups, you know. And Isaac had to learn that, as well as Abraham. Now, we're not all called that way, but we are all called to watch out lest we dilute our discipleship, so called for the sake of the kids. I shall never forget going to a home of a Christian worker who had seven children. And he asked me to speak at an evangelistic meeting in his home and it was a right wow of a time because all seven kids brought their own particular friends who they were praying would be converted. And the house was absolutely taken over with this evangelistic meeting. But the lovely thing was to see a family where mum and dad had encouraged the kids to be involved in getting the gospel out to lost people. And it was a wow of a setup. I can think of other situations where folks say, well, we used to do that when we, when we didn't have kids, but now, of course, we don't want to upset their playtime. Well, let's think about it. The test of a man's faith doesn't just affect him, but his children. But I want you to suggest to you, too, that when he said, give me your son, it was a test for Abraham's future as well. This was pre-pensions period, you'll understand, wasn't it? Well, who on earth is going to provide for him in his dotage? You see, the whole promise of security that God had given to Abraham seemed to depend, indeed it did depend, upon Isaac. So Abraham had to consider, it says so in verse 19, he considered and he thought about it and he came to realize, says verse 19, that the promise didn't depend upon Isaac, it depended upon God and God alone. I was reminded as I was thinking about this about a sentence in the principles and practice of our own mission. Listen, let me read it to you, it's a bit of neat Hudson Taylor. Every member should recognize that his dependence for the supply of all fellowship and personal needs is not on any human organization but upon God alone who called him and whom he serves. Although funds might fail or the fellowship cease to exist, if the members put their trust in him, he will never fail nor disappoint them. I would submit to you that that's not just a principle for a missionary with IMF. How often we state our security in terms of something that can so easily evaporate away or the Lord can take from us. He believed God was able and he saw God was able. And when you are tempted to cling to a person whom for some reason or another you think that you desperately need follow Abraham's example consider what God can do consider what God can do are you a mum or a dad with a child who's wrestling with a call to missionary work and you're scared out of your wits about it so often the case I often tell people when I went to the mission field in the training course I was the one single man and there were 18 single women and it was like a nunnery but the thing that was even more worrying than that was that the majority of the folk on that course came from Christian homes and the majority of them had parents who opposed them going to take the gospel to Asia. That's terrible. But so often we cling to another security, don't we? Remember how the Lord said, if you lose mother or father or parents or whatever it is for my sake in the gospel, you'll receive a hundredfold with persecutions. When the Lord called me to this strange and foreign country of Scotland, he actually gave me a mum and dad here, a real Scottish mum and dad. Isn't that great? The Lord takes us by surprises that our dependence is to be on him, 
not on special people. So much for Abraham. Now let's look at his descendants. His descendants are there in verses 20 to 22. Rather nice to see them there because they're still following the Lord. You see, they were not turned off the Lord by their parents' hard discipleship. Rather, they were turned on. I personally think it's rather a nice testimony that a general director of our mission today is James Hudson Taylor III. And when you think of the way that Hudson Taylor behaved with his kids, well, some people's hair stands on end. Say, what a rough time they had of it. And their children and their grandchildren, and they're still working for the evangelization of Asia, and still switched onto it. Praise God when it happens. It happened with this lot as well in the Bible, do you see? Now you look at verses 20 to 23, 22, sorry. By faith Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. What does this mean? It means that they, were, they believed that they were serving the right cause even when they personally saw no results. I was reminded of David Ellis's uncle who worked for 50 years in Afghanistan to see two people converted and they were both murdered by having ground glass put in their food. And these patriarchs, they continued on with it knowing that they were on the right lines even though they saw no results. And as we re rejoice to see the Lord building a church in Afghanistan we know that David's uncle was on the right lines too now it's important to understand this they still love the Lord and they still committed their children to no one else because though they had not seen the answer yet they still believed the promises and that's why you've got Joseph's box of bones being carried around the place it's a rather sort of macabre visual aid isn't it You've, got, that, you've got, got Joseph's box of bones, they'd say. Why did he have to carry around the box of bones? Why couldn't he have a decent burial somewhere else? He wanted to say to the people, and he wanted them to have that visual aid that would say to the people, I still believe that God will do what he promised. I still believe that he's going to give you that land. And you're to carry that testimony with you until you find that it's true for yourself. Is that what you're saying to your children today if the Lord's given them to you? Look, son, I haven't got it all, I haven't learned it all, and I don't understand it all. But you live by what God says and you'll not be disappointed. That's what they were doing. Now, perhaps there are a couple of principles. Some of you are saying, well, it's all very well for Dick to talk about that with his, with his tribe, but, but, but I haven't got any kids. And what are the principles for me? Well, there's two for you and for those of us that have got kids as well. The first is that faith, as we've seen already, is for life. It is not just a student hobby. And we need to ask ourselves a very important question here. Does your faith depend upon results or depend upon feeling happy? Because if it does, it is not Bible faith. Bible faith is holding on to the Lord whatever comes and wherever he leads. The second thing that you want, I want you to see about these guys here is that they communicated according to their vision and not according to their experience. There is a very pious and wrong statement that is often said about what we witness and what we share. And it is said you cannot lift people any higher than you have got yourself. That is a very dangerous and unbiblical statement. Because the sad conclusion that people draw from that is that only super saints can minister and bring people up to half a degree lower than themselves. It is nonsense. We are to communicate according to our vision. You may find things in the Bible that you know are true because God has promised them and you haven't yet worked it out in your own experience. It's still true. 
and that person you share it with may overtake you in that Christian life. Well, praise the Lord, as I communicate with you about our responsibility to our kids, you say, all right, Dick, but your kids aren't grown up and haven't, as it were, lived through their lives to heaven yet. All right, so I minister to you according to my vision, not according to my experience, and sit under the word and long to that I may fulfill that vision in my own family as you do in yours. So we are to minister. The last part of this business of what about the children is in verse 23. Verses 23 to 28 are the section on Moses' faith, but they begin with his parents' act of faith from the time he was born. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Do you see, Moses was brought into a home where the Lord was the head of that household. It showed in their attitude to Moses' safety. It showed in their belief of his significance. They saw that he was a child of significance, that God had got plans for that child. It showed in their refusal to submit to ungodly laws, which was dangerous, but they were not going to do what the state said when God didn't. And in those earliest days of Moses' life, I believe the Lord was as real in that home as was his own mum and dad. And so it's not surprising that in verse 24, by faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. When he was grown up, he followed the same pattern that his mum and dad had. There's a sort of statement that is a funny half-truth. God has no grandchildren. These are God's grandchildren we're reading about here. They are people who at the earliest days are brought into a trusting relationship with the Lord together with mum and dad. And we who are evangelicals who believe very strongly in the need of personal commitment must not disparage the godly home. We do it to our peril. And we deny the promises of God when we do. Train up a child in the way that he will go and when he is old he will not turn from it, says the proverb. A warning, if you let the child choose his own way then he'll get stuck in that rut. A promise, if you train him up in the ways of the Lord to encourage us together. So much then for what about the kids? Let's move on to the second thing that I want to think about for a few minutes. The life of faith is all very well, but what about the kids? Now the life of faith is all very well, but what about belonging in the world? And this is what we think about from verse 24 through to verse 27. What about belonging in the world? And the first thing that we see in these verses is that faith's first loyalty is to King Jesus. That if we're going to trust the Lord, we trust him as the boss of the universe and there is nobody who calls the shots before him. Look at verse 23. They hid their child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Verse 27. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now, neither Moses nor his parents were violent revolutionaries, so let's not try to pretend that they were sort of part of the liberation theology of Latin America. But they were not people who were prepared to submit to the state whether it was right or wrong. They followed the maxim of Jesus, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And so we find them in the same sort of pattern as the apostles in Acts chapter 4, you will remember, where at verse 18 we read this. 
the Sanhedrin called them and charged them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, but we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. State persecution of the people of God is not ancient history, you know. There have been more people died for following Jesus in this century than in any century. Than in any century. And the people of God are to trust the Lord and obey him first. I wonder if when on a, 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 on a Sunday morning you look up and find half the gallery here full of Malaysians, whether you pray for them as they go home. During the days when we were an imperialistic power, we made an agreement with the sultans of Malaysia that we would not evangelize the Malays. That agreement that we made has been strengthened by the government now. So it is illegal to share the gospel with 50% of the population. What are our brothers and sisters going to do when they go home? If they share the gospel, they are risking being put in prison. Or should they be good law-abiding citizens? Does the Great Commission override the ruling of the government? This is not an academic question. This is a question that some of our church members are grappling with, brothers and sisters, and we've got to prepare them for it. Faith puts its first loyalty to King Jesus. The authority of God had to come before any other authority. Perhaps as we draw up to this election time, we will want to pray that our leaders will know something more of the authority of God. The second thing I want you to see of this in terms of our belonging in the world is that faith is a fellowship business. Verses 24 to 26. By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to share ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered abuse suffered for the Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Faith is not just a private thing. It's not just a me thing. It's an us thing. Our trust in the Lord Jesus makes us brothers and sisters, doesn't it? And we belong together as brothers and sisters in that way. Look at the super opportunity that Moses had through this amazing chance of being picked up out of the water by Pharaoh's daughter and being brought up in the palace. Look at the opportunity that he had for his life. He was going to have life in the palace. What prestige! You can't do better than that in those days. He was going to have pleasures, it says in verse 25. He was going to have treasures, it says in verse 26. Very, very attractive all this, isn't it? Let me ask you, what are the sort of priorities that you and I have in trying to decide what we're going to do with our lives and how we're going to spend time? Isn't getting on in the world, being happy and making a bit more money rather important? Then we need to watch out because it would have led Moses into big trouble. Notice, will you instead, Moses' priorities, brothers and sisters? Firstly, he would not sacrifice his fellowship links, even if it meant suffering. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to share ill treatment with the people of God. Ill treatment with us lot 
You say, well, I trust the Lord, but I just can't stand those folk at St George's Tron, or it's all right in Glasgow, but when I get back home to my home village, well, there's such a lot, and honestly, well, I don't know what my friends would think if I got in with them. I really wouldn't have any standing with my friends, not if I was mixed up with that lot. That was Moses' problem. But notice his priority. I'd rather have it rough and be in the fellowship than have it easy and be out on a limb. That's important. Notice his second priority. His second priority was to call sin by its name even if it was enjoyable. To enjoy, he refused to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. You can put the stress on the first and the third word or you can put the stress on the other two. You can either put the stress on enjoy the pleasures or you can put the stress on fleeting sin. And Moses chose to do the second one and it led him to abuse. People abused him. Brothers and sisters, are there things that we enjoy because sin is enjoyable that we've got to be honest about and call sin? I guess the sex life of Egypt was not quite the same as the morals of the people of God. I guess the sex life of Glasgow University is rather different from what the good book says. You may say, well, it's very enjoyable. That's right. That's what the Bible says too. And it's sin. Would you stand with Moses? Call it what God calls it. Get out. Get out of it quick. Maybe you need the people of God to help you do that. Maybe you should have got involved in that Christian fellowship because you felt it more important to be there in the bar and now you're doing I don't know what around that sort of area. You said it was more important to be there to get on and you got dragged down into sin. And you did need the fellowship after all. Moses learned his lessons early enough. The third thing we notice is he put the treasure of Christ before the treasures of Egypt. In other words, he laid up treasure in heaven. He didn't divide his loyalties there. He might also almost have written 1 Timothy 6. Do you remember where it says in verse 9, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare, into many senseless and hurtful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, not money as the song says, but the love of money is the root of all evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced their hearts with many pangs. Some want salvation, but they don't want to be bound up with God's people. They want prestige, they want that bit of fun as they call it. They want a bit of worldly security. You must watch out. So must I. I must pray for you. You must pray for me. Because we're all vulnerable. That brings me to the last section that I want us to think about tonight. You'll be relieved. And it's shorter. You'll be even more relieved. The life of faith, finally, brethren, is about full salvation. That's what verses 28 to 31 say. You'll notice that after that it says, For time would fail me to tell of the others, and it will do. But the life of faith is about full salvation. Will you notice firstly verse 28 Faith applies God's way with the blood 
That sounds complicated, but we'll look at it. Verse 28. By faith he kept the Passover, did Moses, and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. You remember the story of the Passover? Well, you don't remember the story of the Passover? (laughs) Well, the Passover was like this, do you see? The Lord had tried all sorts of ways of persuading the Egyptians that it was not on for them to keep hold of the people of God. Let my people go. And they still resisted it. And the Lord said, right, the destroyer is going to come. Now who deserved to be destroyed in that place? Everybody. Everybody. You say, oh no, it was the Egyptians that were the baddies. The Egyptians were the baddies and the people of God were the sinners. They were all bad. And so the Lord said, there is one way when the destroyer comes that you can be safe. There's got to be a lamb and you take that lamb, a beautiful and a spotless lamb, you kill it and you get all the people into the house and they all eat it and you get the blood and you put it on the doorposts and you hide in there under the blood. And he said, the Lord said, and when I see the blood I shall pass over. And so we find, brothers and sisters, that that night there was a death in every house. Either it was the death of the firstborn son as a judgment on sin or it was the death of the lamb substitute. There was no house where there wasn't a death that night. And we find that Moses believed in the righteous destroyer. He believed that there was a desperate need for the people of God to be passed over. They couldn't just say, oh we're decent sort of people anyway. And he applied the blood proclaiming that they were committed to the substitute, to the one who would die in their place. That was what God had taught them about getting saved. And it was a lovely sort of photograph of what we've got today, isn't it? God will destroy. We need him to pass over then take hold of the Lamb. John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Whether it's Nigerian sin, or Singaporean sin, or Scottish sin, or English sin, whatever the sin, the sin of the world, he takes it away, take hold of him. And faith says, all right, Lord, if you say that's the only way, then I will cling to that and I wouldn't dare trust to anything else. Will you notice, secondly, in relation to this full salvation, that faith follows on where God leads, even when it looks crazily hopeless. Look at verse 29. By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as if on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. If you read Exodus chapter 14, you get this story, and it's, 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 it's hilarious, so you do read it when you get home. Because the Lord deliberately leads them into a situation where you've got mountains here and mountains there and sea there and the Egyptians behind. And the Lord led them that way. And you should have heard the gripe session that followed on from it. It's absolutely unbelievable the way that they talked. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they were in great fear and the people of Israel cried to the Lord and they said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us bringing us up out of Egypt? Isn't this what we said when we were in Egypt? Let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians for it had been better to us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Moses says, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord which he'll work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today you'll never see again and the Lord will fight for you. You only have to be still. The Lord said to Moses, why did you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Well, you know what was in front, don't you? The sea. They were trapped in. They were pursued. And there's the sea, and the Lord says, well, tell them to go forward. 
They'd have looked fools if he hadn't worked, wouldn't they? They wouldn't have just looked daft, they'd have been dead. They'd have had it. And faith walks forward, expecting God to act on his promises. It doesn't sit around and say, what if he doesn't? You see that promise down here? Then there's no what if he doesn't, because our God does when he puts it in writing. I want you to notice perhaps that the unbelievers can't do what the men of faith can do. Did you see that in verse 29? The Egyptians said, oh wow, well if that that crummy lot can do it, then we can do it too. And they zoomed in after them and the, 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 the Lord said, oh no. And there they were, dead on the seashore. The Egyptians. Now that's a very important principle for us to learn. You can't be saved just by doing the things that the people of God do. If you haven't got the Lord and if you haven't responded to the Lord and received the Lord into your heart and all you're doing is coming to church and reading a Bible, if you haven't come to the Lord, you can't do the things that the people of God do and you won't be saved by doing those things. It's an awful tragedy that so many people go on for years doing what Christians do without ever coming to the Lord of the Christians. It does not work. And we need not make that mistake. Notice then that faith does battle God's way, verse 30. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they'd been encircled for seven days. That was a laugh, wasn't it? Can you imagine? Imagine the press reports on this one. You know, it, round they go, and back they go to bed, and round they go. Every night... Not just on Sundays and Wednesdays, but every night, (laughs) round they go. And then what happens? On the last day, seven times round. And down it comes. What a way to go to war! It seemed crazy, didn't it? But God told them, well, that's the way I do things. Now you do it. A couple of years ago we had the Council for the British Isles as the Overseas Missionary Fellowship met together to discuss modern media and how on earth we were going to to persuade the British people that they ought to be burdened for East Asia and start sending out workers. So we talked about all the different modern media things that we could sort of have, you know. And it was a very difficult thing to do in the sort of whole of the British Isles because you can imagine those people down in the southwest of England, they wanted dance and drama and all that sort of thing. And, you know, some of us... uh, sort of Scots who sort of think call that baptised vaudeville and this sort of thing we're not quite so sure about it and it was very difficult to come to one mind do you see? Well you can imagine can't you? But surely if we're really going to get this message across we've got to do some sort of whiz kid stuff stuff somewhere because folks just won't listen you advertise the missionary meeting well you can sort of guarantee that a third of them will stay at home that night and then the Lord said to us as a council it's not more media you want You've got to pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest field. Luke 10 and verse 2. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest field. You say, yeah, well don't be daft. I mean, there's such a few of us who will actually pray anyway. No, that's what it says. So we decided that instead of more media and all that sort of jazz, we were going to get together those who were on furlough and council members that could make it and some of us on home staff and once a month we were going to spend the whole day praying for these things. Last Friday, what was it, 26 young people from this area pop round for the evening because they're wondering whether the Lord might be perhaps calling them to East Asia. Isn't it funny? We look at the way that the Lord says we're to do the job and we say, well, that seems a bit daft, doesn't it? I mean, honestly, we're busy people. We haven't got time for prayer, have we? Faith does battle God's way. The last thing you notice in our study for tonight is the way of faith is for every sort of person. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given friendly welcome to the spies. Verse 
this is the woman from Jericho and what a woman not a very good girl but the only one that got saved she was the only one in her society who was prepared to turn round and side with the Lord she risked everything she changed kingdoms from the kingdom of darkness that was headed for destruction to the kingdom of light that in New Testament terms is the kingdom of Jesus, the Saviour. And she became one with the people of God. And she began to work for their victory. And Rahab was saved. Do you think it's rather unfair of the writer to Hebrews so many hundred years after she'd been a naughty girl to put her down as Rahab the harlot. The thing that I find very lovely is that this chapter says that God is not ashamed to be called the God of Rahab the prostitute. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that beautiful? You see, her past life was no reason to stop her coming to our Saviour. And her past life did not mean that God was never going to use someone like her. He got a victory in Jericho because Rahab the harlot turned by his grace and became an instrument for victory in the hand of God. Are you the sort of person that despairs because you've done it pretty bad? Maybe you've done it pretty bad and nobody knows about it. Maybe you've done it pretty bad and like Rahab, everybody knows and God knows whichever sort you are. Our God specialises in working on sinners. He doesn't push them out. He welcomes them in. Yes, there were scars and memories for Rahab. But God got a great victory in her life and through her life.